Welcome back to the Rotowire Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm Alan Soslowski, standing in for Jeff Erickson. And every Wednesday, we bring on an industry guest. This Wednesday, I got to pick. So there was no other person I was going to invite other than Sigmund Bloom from the Football Guys and the Audible. Yes, that's right. That Sigmund Bloom. What's up, Sig? Oh, what's up is our the fire hose is on. We are getting new actionable information almost every day things that confirm our priors, things that open our minds. And it's that time of year when you can feel everybody's coming online, our whole football world, our whole fantasy football world. Football's back. We love hanging out with each other. That's what fantasy football is all about. And I'm happy to be on your show this morning. Yeah, you know what? It's interesting for for those of us who produce uh, fantasy football content all year round. And this is an interesting it's it's a bittersweet time of year because, yes, everyone's coming online, like you said. But we also feel like, hey, we've been doing this. We know all the ADPs. We know everything since February. We feel like a little bit of uh, like welcome to the party. Uh, yeah. You know, finally, you got here. Do you do you feel that way, too, sometimes? Sure. Or an, another way to look at it is we're obsessive and unhealthy. And <laughs> because the crowd grows, we don't feel so obsessive and unhealthy. But yeah, I think this also gets into some things like when you have your draft. I know some people like having their draft late because you don't worry about injuries, torpedoing someone's team. But at the same time, it gives everyone time to catch up. And over the 15 or so years that I've been doing this, the information, the quality of information, the depth of information gets better and better and better. And now, Alan, it's not so much do you have information, it's whose information or what kind of information are you acting on? Because there's so much information that now it's not finding it, it's filtering it. You make an interesting point there. So, you know, going back, I mean, how long have you been doing this for? When did you start doing fantasy football analysis and, and doing content? Yeah, officially, Football Guys hired me as a staff writer in 2006, and Cecil and I started the Audible in 2006, so that's when I mark it. But really, it, the journey started for me whenever I got my first office job in the year 2000, and I realized I was in front of a computer every day. I liked managing my fantasy teams better than my job. So I thought, why don't I try to make that my job? And somehow it came along so that that was actually a real thing, because at the time I did it, it was absurd. Just a, a a short Google search, um, you know, sends back that you were uh, doing. You were a lawyer, right? Is, yep. is that was your humble beginnings? Was in law school? Very briefly, yes. I knew this. I could take up the whole podcast with this t topic. Well, I knew on, at the orientation of law school at the University of Texas that I probably wasn't going to be an attorney, but I liked being a professional student for a little while. I was a defense attorney for about two and a half months with training wheels. You can get a bar card before you graduate from law school if a experienced attorney signs off on it. And I believed everything my clients told me and I couldn't negotiate. So if you're in a league with me, remember this, <laughs> I couldn't negotiate. I would give up the farm. So I knew right away that it wasn't in me to be a defense attorney. So what was that conversation like with your family when you said that, Hey, I'm not going to be a lawyer anymore. I'm going to be a fantasy football. And this is 2000, you sure. know, the early two thousands, they must've looked at you. I want to hear about that conversation. Well, I think that everybody around me, Alan, has always known that I was just going to do what I was going to do, even if it was foolish, even if I was running, jumping into the cactus patch, you know? So I didn't really get a lot of pushback, and this isn't... See, as soon as you say it's not a humble brag, then it sounds like a humble brag, right? I was fortunate because of a few things I had going for me that I did have a full scholarship to law school. So it was kind of just what I was going to do. Um, but I think that I remember when I told my dad that I got the full scholarship, he said, I guess I can't tell you what to do anymore. Yeah, th that's so. Was it him that encouraged you? Like, who is it that encouraged you and told you that you had the goods and that you should push forward with this? Because no matter what new venture we do, we always experience a little self doubt, especially in the beginning. Sure. I so think that if I can go back to one moment, Cecil's big. Cecil Lammy is really, really big. Cecil will say things like, hey, if you don't ask, the answer is no. So why not ask? Uh, and Cecil just had that just do it Nike kind of attitude. Like, let's just do this. Before there was a podcast, he, we, our first podcast we recorded because how he did it was over the phone and he put the, the headset, the phone, up to a tape recorder. That's how we did our original podcast. That's how far back we, we go. Um, and I think that I can remember being on the south side of Pittsburgh. I'm from Pittsburgh. I was on the south side of Pittsburgh, I think in 2004 maybe. I, was, I, I know because I'm trying to think who it was that was coming up at the time for the uh, Kasim Osgood, uh, uh, Malcolm Floyd was just coming up for the Chargers, and I was talking to a Chargers fan, and just, you know, 
like a fire hydrant of information. Like it was just like all, all the get excited about this and get excited about this and you know, Philip Rivers and so on. And he was getting excited. He said, wow, like, I wish I had talked to you earlier in the season because now I'm excited about my Chargers. Now I've, I've, and I thought, okay, I can do this. I can convey my excitement, my enthusiasm, my passion for this and, and spread it because there's certainly a lot of people out there that connect with football as, as a very important thing in their life. And it was at the time an untapped like frontier of creating all this content about football. And the other thing I want to point out too, us sitting here right now as part of this, I originally went to broadcast journalism program at Syracuse University, Newhouse. Anybody who's in the media understands what that means. I dropped out of that after a year and a half. You know, it's a pattern here, Alan. The only thing I've really been able to stick with is fantasy football, right? Uh, because at the time, broadcast journalism was a terrible industry as far as the pay, as far as the opportunities, as far as how long you had to work just to get a chance to get the job you actually wanted. And now fast forward, that was in 1993 when I enrolled in Syracuse. Fast forward to 2006, and all of a sudden the barriers to entry are done. You can transmit something to the whole world for almost nothing. And then it becomes a democracy, right? Because we didn't vote and elect the anchors on our uh, local news show. You know what I mean? It, it was, becomes a meritocracy almost in a sense. Right. It's just yeah. whose voice gathers people who can amplify that because, and there's, you know, there's another conversation here. So it's a really special time. There's so many things we could talk about that are sad or downtrodden. It's a cruel and wicked world. But at the same time, it's the best time to want to have your voice out there and have your voice be heard. Yeah, and we're going to get to Sigmund's fantasy football takes. And again, you can get those on his show on the Football Guys on the Audible podcast. And my my favorite, which is his On the Couch series, where he talks to fantasy football analysts and uh, gets their takes, and then obviously gets into some off the rail stuff. And I <laughs> guess this is you being on the couch a little bit, or in Always. my uh, in my uh, yeah. <laughs> so just a couple more questions for you. Mm -hmm. like, like you know, you have all the wisdom now of of doing this, of seeing this before the the barriers for entry were as easy they are to get to now if you can go back then to yourself in the 20s what advice do you think you might give yourself don't be afraid don't be afraid and then you want to go out on the couch and really everything is therapy for me i always like to say my show really boils down to i'm lonely can anyone hear me and someone like <laughs> you a nice person like you say i can hear you and i'll say oh that makes me feel better thanks and just rinse repeat uh don't be afraid I, if i'm going to get on the couch here i can say i can look back on my life and i have lots of blessings and lots of joys and lots of um you know, oh, 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 my cup overflows with, with good things. But I also look and think about what I could have done if I wasn't afraid of failure, or I wasn't afraid of the judgment of other people, or I wasn't afraid of looking ridiculous, or wasn't afraid of getting in over my head. And what I like to tell the young people that I meet now, I can say young people when I'm 46, right? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm 45, going to be 46. So yeah, it's it, we we're we're officially like people. yeah, we, we could joke and say we're old because we're really not. But yeah, not go yet. Ahead. And when we yeah. actually get old, we're going to wish we never said we were old. These we're are the yet. good old days, right? So don't assume that people know what they're doing. I would like to say, speaking of law school, Alan. I know you probably heard this before because this is my show. I'm going to give everybody out there, I'm going to save you, I don't even know, I used to say $100,000. That's dated, right? I don't even know how much it is to go to law school now. I'm going to save that, you- That's uh, first semester right there. Right, right. I'm going to save you hundreds of thousands of dollars in three years and tell you what you learn in law school. Everybody is making it up as they go along. And you can too. That and you can too part is the part that I think a lot of people don't understand. And for young people out there, especially, don't assume other people know better. Don't assume that the people who have been around and been running things know better. You might know better. You might be better. So don't be afraid of what's going to happen. And I actually think that the young people of today don't need that. Because Alan, now that I know that we're truly contemporaries, you know, we were coming up under the sign of, say, Kurt Cobain. That was one of mm. our icons. Who cares? I'm pulling out. I'm, I don't want to be part of this. You know, this is ugly. This is something that... It makes repels me. And I think the young people today, even though there are a lot of things in the world that do repel you that are ugly, are jumping right in. They're not waiting for someone to tell them what to do. And that matches up with what I was saying earlier about it being a time when you can just do your thing and put it out there and have it gain momentum with very few obstacles now. 
Now you said something interesting before. I just want to underline. You talked about like why we do this, and you know, a lot of and we measure ourselves. Like, okay, so back in the '80s, people uh, might measure themselves with what kind of car they drove. In the '90s, what kind of clothing they had. We 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 fall into it that we measure ourselves by clicks and likes and how many followers that we have is status in now in in mm-hmm. today's economy. So, but what are we really saying with that? We're really saying is, hey, how many people are interested? Can I connect with in the same niche or same passion that I have? Because we really don't care about clicks. We care about like you talk about a lot engagement, connecting with people that are of like mindedness. Yeah, it's unburdening, right? I think so. Now you're really going to get me to go highfalutin here. Good. <laughs> this is where I really, I mean, if I love football. And there's a lot of things I love. There's a lot of things that could be a handshake just to get to human connection. And I think that if we merge back with infinite knowledge, you know, Alan, like our mommy is earth, is animal. Our daddy is God or a creator or a creator energy. That's what makes us different. You know, we're not like the other animals. We're part animal. We're related to the animals. But I'll look around. We're a little different. And I think that because of that, we have this amazing uh, frontal lobe, this ego that tells us about the I. I'm separate. It's about me. America, especially right now. We're going through some interesting trials and tribulations in America right now that's testing. Like, how far can you go in a nation that is interdependent, but at the same time makes everyone think that they're on their own, they're self made? And we're testing this, the, the binds that bind us together right now. And it creates this illusion that you're separate, but you're not. The, the, it's an illusion. It's how we perceive this reality that we're in. But it's not actually an aspect or attribute of this reality. It's an attribute or aspect of our perception of it. And we, get mis- we mistake those things for each other. And when we feel better, it's not when we feel the most separate. It's whenever we let the actual truth that everything is one then those boundaries between us dissolve and it doesn't have to be with another person it can be like climbing the side of a cliff it can be golf it can be there's so many things it can be cooking like you're just like making you know your favorite dish there's so many things when you forget yourself and certainly human interaction is one of the best uh when two brains or more than two brains start to do a little dance it has a chemical reaction with each other and it, it's it's unburdening, and now more than ever we need that. I really think that fantasy football is there a lot go. of people's. It's it's their safe space or their happy place, or a place where they feel like they're in control. When so many things in our life make us feel like we're not in control, or there's so many things in our life that greatly affect our life that we can't do anything about. And at least when I'm managing my fantasy team, even if I'm leading them to an O and thirteen season, I'm in control, and I'm not thinking about anything else, and all of those things fade into the background. Well, and that's why in you hit on the last part is really what I wanted to stress is that fantasy football is that for a lot of us. Yeah. It's you know, I mean, I, I watched football my whole life before I played fantasy. I'm sure you did too. It's actually what was it? What's the first nostalgic memory you have of football? You know, I mean, oh, I yeah. think back, is it a video game? Is it was it a specific game that happened? Like yes. what was it that you I know you know the moment that you connected yes. the football? Yes, yes. Kellen Winslow, Miami, San Diego, having to almost be carried off the field by his teammates. Just a game that just left everything on the field. And uh, it was it was epic. You know, it was like a myth. It was like a story that you tell over the campfire. But we got to watch it happen. I think I was six years old for that game. It, and, and the next one probably would be John Riggins running the Super Bowl. Yes. Um, it, it's just electrifying. Mass consciousness. Millions of people. Uh experiencing this moment in real time together. And I think with football especially, it's played at the, that razor's edge. That's what makes football different than other sports. I think that the players are aware of this. And any play, like Troy Polamalu just went into the Hall of Fame, he crossed himself before and after every single play. He prayed before and after every single play. And maybe he especially needed to. But they're putting it all on the line for us on every single play. Like, when you and I are podcasting, it isn't like, oh, at any point my vocal cords could just let go and I could never be able to talk again, right? But that's what they're doing. And I think we're, we, we identify with that because whether we realize it or not, like the speech in No Country for Old Men, you're, we're putting it on the line every day. But we have to calm ourselves down. If we actually are aware of that all the time, we're going to be in a panic. We're going to be overcome with anxiety. So I think it allows us 
to um, cathartically get that out, especially if you're at a football game or even if you're just yelling at your TV. You don't get a chance to react to everything in real time in life. We have to keep going. We have to keep going. We have to keep going. And sports is a place where you can act crazy. You can express yourself. You can weep. You know, you can jump up and down. Sporting events are one of the last places where you can be intoxicated in public. So I think that represents the release that it gives us. Well, you could also be intoxicated in public in your hometown right now. In New Orleans, yes. (laughs) And it's encouraged, actually. Right. Eventually, it may be required. Yep. Okay, we're just going to take a break right now for a quick word from our sponsors. Okay, we're back. That, of course, uh, you know, that was just for the uh, the audio version. You know, you, you know how this is done. <laughs> uh, so a reoccurring theme on on your show, which I really connect with, and you talk about music a lot, and specifically 90s hip-hop, 80s oh, yeah. hip-hop. I've heard you talk about Stetsasonic before. And excuse me, anyone under 30 right now that is saying this is old man <laughs> rap talk, no, it is. If so. you're under 30, go check out this music. It's really good. Yeah. I mean, you even the uh, the closing to one of your podcasts is you have you talk about vinyl. I mean, I collect Mm -hmm. vinyl as well. What is it about? I mean, is that a clip from a podcast? Like, where is that clip of you talking actually from when you're talking about vinyl? I probably made that speech. There's so many speeches I make. I don't remember who I said things to or how often I've said things. And people that are listening to the show like yourself are very kind because I probably have certain things that I say every couple of years or every year as if is the first time I said it. So, uh, you know, the speech about vinyl just makes music a ritual and it makes, it it slows you down. If there's anything that we all need, it's just to slow down a little bit more. Just slow down. Be present. Focus your attention on something. And when you have to take a record out, handle it gently, and place the needle on the record gently, it creates a more uh, a ritual, an experience where you're giving your attention over it. And it's dramatic. And, and when you hear the music start, you're, you're taken to it, and you experience the album the way that the artist contemplated as a journey and not just song, 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 song. Um, and then the other, thing I'll say, yeah. the other thing I'll say about hip-hop real quick, because I, I, I think I heard, I was watching this show, this new show, I can't remember who it was, I wish I could, in Twitter that said, check out this Mark Ronson, watch the sound show. And I could get into a review of Mark Ronson specifically and what I might change about the show with respect to that. But there is, um, there is a, a section about sampling. One of the episodes is about sampling. I thought it was a really great point that he made, or I don't remember if it was him or it was one of the guests saying that hip hop came out of the Bronx in the 70s, right? And the music programs at school were slashed down to nothing. So they didn't have instruments. Because like down here, you see brass bands, the marching bands. Like it just keeps making all these incredible musicians. There was nothing in the Bronx. What do they have? Turntables. Turntables. They had turntables and they had records. And they used that to create, I'm getting like the hairs on my back of my neck are standing up, Alan. Me too. <laughs> because I, 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 still, I still have turntables in my room. I have my two Technique 1200s. It's amazing, right? Because the folks in the Bronx created something that changed the world, that really changed the world, and they were just trying to have a good time, right? And I think it also is analogous to what's going on with podcasting and this idea that just with what you have, with equipment that anybody can have, you can create something that ripples out there and who knows what will change. So you strike me as somebody who, you know, especially at this point of your life where, you know, you've, you're confident in your craft. Uh, it's, it's proof of concept. You're still grateful and humble about it, but is there ever a time, I guess want to go back to that concept of self doubt. Like yeah. any time that you tweet, I mean, you have, you know, close to a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. Every time you tweet something, people are going to have a reaction. It might be good. It might not be good. Do you ever second think before you hit publish? I had Adam Schefter on this podcast um, a couple weeks ago mm-hmm. and I asked him the same thing. He has 8 million. I mean, you must experience that in some way, or do you just click publish and whatever happens happens? Sometimes there are a few tweets out there that have been deleted. And what's great <laughs> is, What's great is that, I mean, sometimes your brain just gets ahead, your fingers get ahead of your brain and you realize, I think there was one the other day I replied to where someone was talking about Reuben Foster. And I thought, are you talking about Robert Robert Foster? He's, he's, not, he's on a team, he's on Miami. Anyway, um, thankfully, and this is, I think for everybody in social Ro- media. Robert Foster, the former, was it seventh round pick that was on Buffalo, right? Is right, that who you, right. okay. He had yeah. an amazing rookie year because the, the context was amazing rookie years that amount to nothing. And, oh, okay. they, and they mentioned Ruben Foster. I was thinking of, and they said he's out of the league already. Anyway, I think this is important for people in this age of social media. One of the things I like to say about social media is you reveal things about yourself, but different things than you think you're revealing. Mm. 
another thing is, and I think people experience this, you curate an audience that basically reflects back out you back at you the energy that you exude. So I'm very lucky. And I really don't have to worry about that too much because when I make a mistake, people kindly and gently will say, hey, actually, I think that you met, you were thinking of Robert Foster, that's Reuben Foster in that example. And it's not scary. And I've, I, I don't want to say I take credit for it. I've just, I'm very lucky that the people that follow me are, are, you know, one of the things that happens to Alan is it happens to football guys a lot. Joe Bryant, he's, a, you know, a leader and inspiration in a lot of ways. Someone will email football guys and say, you got this wrong. And he'll say, hey, we do the best we can. This is why we did it. This is why we had that projection or that ranking. We are always working to get better. Sorry that it hurt your team and you lost because of it. And we appreciate that you support football guys. And you know what they reply? Oh my God, I love football guys. I can't believe you replied ah. to me. I've been subscribing for 12 years. Thank you so much. So that right. first, even that first in uh, back and forth can be fangs bared, right? But if you treat people like a human being, most often it's going to get past that. So I think that's a good thing to remember to you know keep the drama down in your social media feeds. I I want to echo that because I've had that experience, and you know I won't bore people with my, the long story version for me because they're here to see you right now, Sig. But uh, I I referee high school basketball when these coaches, Ooh. yeah, it's it's brutal. That's it's the it's, weeds. You're down in the weeds there. Yes, the AAU circuit too is in the summer is particularly bad, but uh, bad meaning good. I you know it's it's it, it gets my juices going. But when the coaches come in my face and they scream at my face, and I say, Hey, coach, I missed that one, or Hey, coach, uh, let, uh, you know, I just kind of me defang them as you just said mm -hmm. it changes the whole conversation and on social media that's amplified tenfold so uh, i just want that that ex uh, story that you had kind of clicked with me a um, couple of things here you you mentioned about how there's so much fantasy football information out there mm -hmm. nowadays what the, is the edge in fantasy football i mean if you want to talk about your personal edge but like how do you gain an edge in fantasy football when you know, somebody who comes in two weeks ago knows all about the sleepers and rookies that are going to pop just because they read any of our content. Really the only, it's not even an edge. I think it just it circles fantasy football all the way back around to its origins, Alan, which is just picking the right players, knowing who's good, knowing what teams are going to be good, knowing what offenses are going to be good. And some of this is based on research, but some of it is just intuition. I know you've heard me make this speech many times because you listen to the show. Intuition is not mystical. It's not from some beyond it's just the sum of all of our experiences of all of the things we've observed and it comes out in a gut feeling or it comes out in a yum or yuck or yes no the light of binary kind of the light is on or the light is off uh so yeah i think it's just getting in tune with the players who and teams and units that are on the rise i think that's reducing it back to which is why why did fantasy football start right it's because you thought i wish i could put together a team of my favorite players of the players that I think are the best players in the league. And we can still do that. And we should always get back to that essence of fantasy football. So now I want to ask you just a couple of very specific yes. fantasy football questions. Uh, again, I could keep going with, uh, you know, oh, asking yeah. you about your background and hopefully we can do it again sometime. Any, uh, anytime, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're awesome. So, um, you talked about on your Chargers preview. So anyone that has should go check out uh, the Football Guys podcast, uh, Sigmund and Cecil. They break down every team uh, with their preseason uh, look at the whole roster. And you were talking about Justin Herbert in the Chargers preview, and you called him usefully oblivious. <laughs> that clicked with me. That was like my eyeballs. Explain the context sure. and explain exactly what you mean by that. And I think that Joe Flacco had this early in his career. Ben Roethlisberger had this early in his career. You know, another way I can spin this too, Alan, is just finish watching the Olympics. I could, you know, you probably have heard me go off on Olympic tangents for the last couple of weeks. And you see these sometimes even 14-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. There's this amazing 18-year-old um, swimmer from Tunisia, Ahmed uh, Hafnawi, who won a marquee 400-meter race and the, as he's coming down the stretch, the announcers are saying, well, he can't win because he was in lane eight, which is basically the equivalent of, you know, you're just filling out the field. But he was 18 and he did it. And I think that, for instance, in the context of the Olympics, when it's your first Olympics and you're still a teenager, you don't realize yet how difficult it is to even get there. You don't realize yet how much is on the line. You don't realize yet how few opportunities 
you will get in your life to do that. So in some ways, you put no pressure on yourself. And I think that's an example of that concept. But I, some of these young quarterbacks come into the league and you can see the whole weight of the world is on them from the moment they step on the field. And then some of these young quarterbacks like Justin Herbert last year, like, I want to play, let's play football. If anything, you have to wonder what was holding him back at Oregon. If there was something where he was a little bit robotic and a little bit mechanical and methodical in Oregon where it's the way he was coached. And maybe it's because they didn't expect him to have to play. It was not the plan for him to play. It was a wayward needle uh, that took Tyrod Taylor out for week two. So again, maybe because maybe this is how every rookie quarterback should learn they're going to start their first game, like an hour before the game, when you don't have time to psych yourself out, when you don't have time to be overwhelmed by the stage. And you just go out there and do what you were hired to do, play some football. It's funny. I mean, you could make the same argument in almost any industry in podcasting. Mm -hmm. I know just, you know, a couple of years ago when I was doing the podcast and and zero people were listening, we were just, you know, loose. And then as things start to get a little bit more and then, you know, people are compensating you for your for your work, then you're like, OK, I just got to make sure I get it right. And so that that goes for any industry. Now, another another uh, term that you used when you were talking about players. Uh, that I think could be useful this year is you talked about players that have small peaks. We, you know, mm -hmm. Justin Forsett from a couple years ago. Small peaks meaning like, uh, why don't you explain what you meant sure. by small peaks, and then give me a one or two players you think this year could experience a small peak that that could be an edge. Well, it's a player that we can look at their career arc and say that it's kind of like the old Sesame Street thing. One of these things is not like the other, and. <laughs> And if there weren't things to portend this future for this player, and it comes later in their career, and especially you brought up Justin Forsett, that it aligns with a good offense or a good unit, good play calling, then those peaks can be based on the convergence of all those factors more than the player himself. I guess in some ways in fantasy football, this is one of the skills you can have, right? Because Alan, we think of it as a player. But what statistic, I was thinking about this, holding penalties is one of the only ones I could come up with. What statistic in football is really an individual statistic? Because it is the ultimate team sport. And there is no way you can talk about what one player did without it implicating what another player did. And what we're trying to discern, well, first of all, what you want to find are the perfect storms. What you want to find is the uh, alignment between the scheme and the execution and the skill and talent of the player. This is how Trey Sermon could be fantastic this year, for instance. You want to find that alignment, that perfect alignment. But part of finding that alignment is understanding when we look backwards, how much of the value was created by the surroundings, by the teammates, and how much of the value was created by the individual. McCole Hardman's a good example in this case, right? How much of Tyreek Hill, Tyree Hill's value is created by Tyreek Hill, and how much of it is created by Patrick Mahomes? And we can bring in the offensive line here, giving Patrick Mahomes time to throw downfield, which should be better. But if you think that Tyreek Hill creates a lot of that value, then you're probably not as into McCole Hardman, because you think, well, if Patrick Mahomes is throwing to other guys, it's not going to go as well, because Tyreek Hill is really important. But if you think that Patrick Mahomes creates more of that value, then you're more inclined to say, well, any guy who's fast, Patrick Mahomes is going to find him when he's open. And even if he drops one out of every three of them, when you get two of them for 60-yard touchdowns, that's going to help your fantasy team. So when those players that weren't showing us things, weren't adding value to their touches, weren't earning opportunities earlier in their career, all of a sudden have these things line up. What's one that's happening right now, Alan? Miles Gaskin, right? Everybody's having to unpack that, well, Miles Gaskin, he won leagues for some people in Week 16 last year. He was the incumbent back. But that doesn't mean that he's going to be used the same way he was last year because in some of the good analytic type analysis models where you say, what round were they drafted in? What was their college production? What are their measurables? There are players who can really outproduce those things and become a different player in the pros. But more often than not, they're going to basically have an arc based on their pedigree. So we can look at those players and understand that it's the players that, are getting touches by default. It's the players that got opportunities because of injury. It's the players that just were the last man standing in a backfield that are probably going to have a very short peak of fantasy production. You're here listening to Sigmund Bloom on the Rotowire Fantasy Football Podcast. You can follow Sigmund at Sigmund Bloom on Twitter. Check out the football guys uh, over there right now. Their draft kit. What else? Uh, what else are you guys pushing out right now? Oof. Just I give mean, us. 
it, what, what are we not pushing out, right? right? I mean, that's the thing. Uh, I'm going to come out with my um, game plan for your draft, which is really going to synthesize a lot of the things that I've been talking about and writing about. Uh, but it's a staff of over 60 people. And we're attacking things from every angle. This is one of the fun things about fantasy football. This is one of the funny things about football guys. You know, uh, we were talking about our mutual friend, Kevin O'Brien. Excellent dude, right? The FF Love. engineer. And the whole concept of the FF engineer means... By the I'm way, gonna... you need to push him to get his podcast back going again. The uh, fantasy we will. We will. Yeah. See, we're we're going to speak too it much. into existence. Yeah. Okay. Now we shame them into doing it. Sorry, I interrupted. Absolutely. No, no, you should. You should, because that's important. That's as important as anything we're talking about in the show. Um, but the idea of I'm going to take what I use and what I've learned and experience as an engineer, and I'm going to apply that to fantasy football, right? We have a hedge fund manager on our staff at Football Guys. We have a doctor on her. Jason Wood. Okay. Which, I mean, what would have been fun is if we would have done like a quiz show. See, I need to do like Football Guys staff quiz show it's trivia and see who can <laughs> identify, like, you know, who, which, which member who? of our staff <laughs> has shot a record buck. Oh, that's Cecil. No, actually, although that's a good guess. The answer is John Norton. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, if, if Cecil's easy one, which one of which one of our staff was destined to be a rodeo star until he decided he wanted to do something else? That's Cecil. That's who is Cecil for a thousand, Alex? I got yes, it. All right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so you know, we bring to bear all of the different things that we do, all of our different experiences in how we approach fantasy football, and it creates this great. Uh, palette where you can find the person who thinks like you who attacks these things like you and there's room for all of them they all work they all create good results if they're done in a sound and disciplined way so that's one of the fun things football guys originally started out as a community where you wanted to be good enough that the community would accept you and then maybe even if you were really good they might ask you to write for them and i think that Proving ground created this sense of if you're good enough to write for football guys or create content for football guys, then that takes away what you were saying earlier, Alan, that seed of self-doubt. If these people accept me, then I know everyone's going to accept me. So let's do lightning round. You've been generous yes. with your time, so I'll, I'll get you out of here in a few minutes. But yeah. what, I, what I like to do is when I have a guest on, I just, I, you know, I mean, yep. who wouldn't do go through their Twitter, right? I go through your Twitter to see what sure. the last 10 or 15 things you tweet on, because these are the things that are your top of your mind. So from a fantasy football perspective, you know, uh, seven seconds or less in each answer. Yes. If you have to go more, that's fine. But Antonio Gibson, now the hype is on. It's in full mode with the last blurb that went out about how they're trying to make him Christian mm -hmm. McCaffrey. Uh, Antonio Gibson, first round pick at this point. I won't talk you out of it. The offense is going to be a lot better, and they're going to give him as much opportunity as he earns. Is you talked about Marvin Jones being the unsexy player to own of the wide receiver Jaguars core, uh, receiving core? I think what we can see is Visca Chenault's not going to be used to the extent we hoped. Chark already got dinged by Urban Meyer. Jones has a history with Brian Schottenheimer. So everything lines up. He's been conducting himself like the number one, like the elder statesman. So we should expect him to be the most valuable Jags receiver this year. What will fantasy players be saying about Urban Meyer in week eight? Mm. Um, when this team is good, he's never going to pass. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, 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 probably in a nutshell, it's funny, the long pause captures it Alan I think by week eight we're probably still going to be guessing about Urban Meyer how much of it is the game script and where the team is at how much of it is Urban Meyer's game plan how much of it is Urban Meyer actually being humble and saying we're going to get the ball in the hands of our best playmakers no matter who we planned on getting the ball in this all spells out James Robinson yeah, I think he's being a little bit undervalued right now. It's uh, it, it, I won't be surprised that if uh, if he ends up being, you know, if he has more fantasy points than Travis Etienne during mm -hmm. the first month of the season. Uh, Crystal Ball, when you look ahead to your 2022 rankings, who do you who who do you think the top five is going to be? Who wouldn't shock you? Who's going to be our top five one QB, top five players right. in our 22 sheet? I mean, McCaffrey and Cook would have to collapse to fall out of the top five. So those are kind of free squares. Uh, I do think that this could be the year, even with all of the hand-wringing about the lack of involvement in the running game, that Nick Chubb is looked at similar to Derrick Henry, the way Henry's looked at now, basically, in fantasy football. So I think he's a candidate. I think, 
Allen, because remember, if Aaron Rodgers is not a Green Bay Packer, then Devontae Adams is not going to be the number one wide receiver. So I think we could easily see Justin Jefferson, A.J. Brown, or D.K. Metcalf as the number one fantasy receiver going into next year. Metcalf especially, because I think everybody's underestimating how good the Seattle offense can be now that they appear to have a competent offensive coordinator that is going to create advantages for Russell Wilson and play to Russell Wilson's strengths instead of Russell Wilson having to overcome a very conservative offense. Uh, Another player I'll toss out there is Joe Mixon. He just needs to stay healthy and this offense needs to come together. Uh, That's a lot. That might be asking a lot, but he has the opportunity to have a, as large a workload as anybody this side of Christian McCaffrey or Dalvin Cook. It's just a question of the surroundings lining up the same way they have for McCaffrey and Cook. It's interesting. We talked about Seattle just briefly. It's like if that season was, if the sequence of that season was reversed, if right. they got off to the slow start in the last eight weeks where Russ cooking, I mean, Russell Wilson would be the QB three and DK mm-hmm. math would be the wide receiver one. So it's just interesting how the sequence of things. So that is probably, and I got two more quick lightning yes. round questions for you. Who's a player you hope secretly, even though you're not telling anyone that gets off to a slow start. So you can, you could either trade for them on the, on the cheap or pick them up when somebody drops them. Ooh, that's a good question because I I'd like this concept. It's a player that you're not drafting, but you want, but you feel like it may not come together right away. I'm buying time by talking this through. Um, how about Elijah Moore? How about because of the groin injury, because his momentum is slowed down a little bit, that people that draft him and can't use him in the first few weeks are not really into him and wonder what happened. Oh, well, this was a bunch of rookie hype. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Um, You know, another player that I think we could take advantage of this kind of dynamic would be uh, DeAndre Swift. I'm not drafting DeAndre Swift. I do think that DeAndre Swift is more likely to be the hot hand in that backfield, and they have a really good run blocking line, and they have an offensive coordinator that wants to run the ball. But you look at their schedule, Alan, and this is a great time to be looking at the schedule, folks. You want to get off to a hot start. They start with San Francisco, Green Bay, and Baltimore. That doesn't. That sounds like games that they're going to be out of by halftime. Like I want T.J. Hawkinson for those games. I don't want DeAndre Swift. So depending on how it goes, uh, Swift could be somebody that people are wondering by week three. Do I even start him after spending a third round pick on him? So I think the schedule can be your key to figure out who by week three, week four are going to be your buy lows. Final question for you, Sig. A player that when they get drafted, you're thankful that somebody yeah. else took them. Yeah, I did a whole series on this, Alan. I called them, it was my uh, old academic league nemesis from high school, Joe Wright, gave me that role, the roll aids team, the all roll aids <laughs> team. First you talk about, I heard that's a reoccurring theme when you guys talk on your podcast, the roll aids yeah, player. Because I, it, it hurt really, your stomach. It, well, because I, I think that relief, concept, relief. It's relief because right. it's not players that you're avoiding. It's not players that you're targeting. It's players that you're ambivalent about. And then when you're on the clock, you really think wrong, think long. Uh, think wrong, think, think long, think wrong. Got that backwards. That you're like, well, you're trying to talk yourself into them. You're trying to talk yourself out of them. So the most prominent player this year on that list is Saquon Barkley. Uh, and I think that, you know, for those of you that say, that's crazy. If I can get him at number 10, I'm going to take him every time. And he works out on the pure talent, then good on you. And for those that like myself you know because i'm at the point now where i even wonder like what i take antonio gibson over barkley probably maybe a more uh, obscure player to think about or someone further down the board would be kareem hunt it's someone that maybe would be an un- unexpected name right and i'll say this kareem hunt is an outstanding player okay if nick chubb said tomorrow i'm retiring from football then we're all taking kareem hunt in the first round of our drafts however Last year, in the second half of the year, he had a few outbursts like that amazing Baltimore game. Hope I hope we get one game this year, Alan, as good as that Baltimore-Cleveland game last year. All the way down to Lamar Jackson like jogging out of the bathroom, out of the tunnel, you know? That, um, the, the poop game. The poop, the poop game. game, right? Yeah. The cramps game. Cramps. Yeah. Cramps. Uh, anyway. <laughs> the cramps were real. They were just in his stomach. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We've all been there. We've exactly, all been yeah, there. Exactly, yeah, right. 45, 46 years old. Yeah. Uh, so... Kareem Hunt actually was very inconsistent in the second half of the year. He did have some peak games, 
but he wasn't a plug and play running back too, which is, I'm not, fifth round is not plug and play necessarily, but he also, and he was a little banged up at the time, Nick Chubb went down. This is all about Nick Chubb, this second part of the show. And Hunt's numbers were actually roughly equal to what he was averaging when Chubb was in. And what nobody talks about is what would happen to Chubb's numbers if Hunt went down, right? We just, very often we have a first rounder that has injury upside. So I feel like Kareem Hunt is a player that maybe is more akin to A.J. Dillon or Tony Pollard, where you're thinking about this amazing upside, but in reality, you have a player that is a flex play, a bi-week emergency kind of play. And Dillon and Pollard cost a ninth or 10th round pick. Hunt costs a fifth round pick. He's Sigmund Bloom from the Football Guys. You can hear him on the Audible podcast with Tisa Lammy on his own podcast on the couch, uh, which is also in the Audible uh, Football Guys feed. Uh, Sigmund, I, I I told you I'd get you out of here in 20 minutes. I've kept you for 40. You're, you're a mensch. I appreciate it. Uh, this was fun for me, and we will be back next week with another guest on the Rotowire Fantasy Football Podcast. Until next